The Faith at Work movement is on a cusp, destined for great things. God uses people from all kinds of walks of life and all kinds of professions to advance His kingdom. Work is a crucible that God uses to refine us. Everybody's work matters to God. The only thing that really brings lasting change is the gospel of Jesus Christ applied to every area of life. Leadership is people who can take other people's pain and turn it into passion. Are you overwhelmed by Jesus Christ? Our lives begin to end the day we remain silent about things that really matter. As an Enron employee, I saw this quote from Martin Luther King Jr. on a daily basis. It was on notepads, magnets, deal toys, hanging from banners, emphasizing one of Enron's core values, communication. The Enron Corporation collapsed in a wave of accounting scandals in 2001 that had had their beginnings in 1997. So why had so many people stayed silent? Well, I think the answer is obvious. It is very difficult to speak troublesome, unwelcome truth to power. In fact, I didn't speak up at Enron until the balance of power had shifted, until Jeff Skilling, our CEO, surprisingly and abruptly quit. Ken Lay, our chairman, was stepping back in as CEO, and I felt like he would be a more willing audience for the terrible news I had to deliver. I've often um, said in speeches that my warnings were too little too late. The company collapsed, but my actions did help mark the prosecutional trail that helped the Department of Justice get over two dozen criminal convictions of Enron executives. I was lauded in the press for my actions. In fact, Time Magazine put me, Colleen Raleigh of the FBI, and Cynthia Cooper from WorldCom on their cover in 2002. It was their Persons of the Year cover. They called it the Year of the Whistleblower. It's given me a platform to speak on leadership, ethics, integrity, but most importantly, courage. It did take a lot of courage for me to meet with Ken Lay. I was on his calendar for a week leading up to that meeting. Um, I was very nervous. I was waking up at 2 a.m. every night, unable to sleep, rehearsing in my mind how I would deliver this news, how I could put it in the right sense, make the good points so he would understand that I really thought we had cooked the books to a level that we would sink. I've used the Titanic as a perfect analogy of Enron. I'm a crew member. I've been working in the bottom of the ship. I know we've hit an iceberg. I know water's pouring in and the lights might be on, the band might be playing, but we're going to sink. So I'm going I'm, to, I'm trying to warn the captain. You know, it'd be his job to save the ship, sound the alarm bells, man the lifeboats. The fall of 2001 remains such a bleak time for me. Ken Lay turned to the executives around him and in effect said, nobody go down to the bottom of the ship. Nobody see if we've, accounting, if we've done accounting fraud. Don't even second guess the accounting. We're paying Arthur Anderson, our outside auditors, $52 million a year. That's a million dollars a week. For that amount, we better be unsinkable. Well, the rest is history. Enron's the byword for mega corporate scandal. But that fall of 2001, I had a two-year-old at home. I was the primary breadwinner for our family, and I had been actively searching for another job outside of Enron ever since I'd discovered the fraud in that August. Well, 9-11 happened, and those terrorist attacks made me really second-guess my priorities. I was so troubled by it, I went to visit one of my pastors. And I explained the situation about how busy my life was working at Enron, and here I was just trying to find another high-powered corporate job. Um, when was I ever going to have time to do for God? You know, do volunteering, give back? I, I was really at a crossroads, and my pastor was very wise. He said, Sharon, first off, God doesn't need you to do anything for him. Um, he said, that nagging sense of guilt you feel is probably him wanting you to grow closer to him. Get involved in some Bible studies, do more worship, praise, prayer, fellowship. Well, he started rattling off some things that just put a worried look on my face. And I guess he kind of took a breath and realized, wait a minute, she's working, she's searching for a job, she's caring for a two-year-old. He said, baby steps. Let's just take baby steps. I know of a group 
just like yourself. It's called the Professional Women's Fellowship. It's working women. They get together once a month over lunch. They hear a godly message, and then you dialogue and discuss what that message means for your work life and your home life. Why don't you see about doing that? It seems so simple, but that was such a godsend to me. It really lets me know that when we take a baby step, a small step towards God, He really shows in a powerful way that it was the right move. Well, I went to those luncheons in October, November, December. December, Enron declared bankruptcy. I was still blessed to be working at the bankrupt estate. Enron had been sued by over two dozen law firms from the shareholders that had lost so much money. Their executives had been sued. Their board had been sued. Thirteen congressional investigations had had started looking into why a company the size of Enron could collapse so quickly. Well, um, I had, I guess my memos, you know, were delivered to Congress from Enron. I'll never forget this day. It was Monday afternoon, January 14th, 2002. Congress had found my memos in a box of subpoenaed documents and they'd leaked my name and my memos to the press. Our phone started ringing off the hook. The next day, I was getting ready for work, and my husband came in to tell me that there are camera crews parked out in the front of the house and the back of the house. Well, I went and looked at, through the windows, and I had this sense of almost like an ambush. I don't know why, but it very much unnerved me. You know, the fuzzy microphones on big sticks, the big cameras. It, it, it was um, a sight to see. I remember that my hand started to shake. It really, it really did unnerve me. I, I spied a Bible and opened it up just by chance, which is amazing. No, it's probably not by chance. To Hebrews 12, 1 to 3. And that passage says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us throw off all that hinders the sin that so readily entangles and run that race marked out for you. Keep your eye focused on Jesus, the author and perfecter of your faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the shame of the cross and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such sinful, such opposition from sinful men. Don't lose heart, don't grow weary. Perfect passage for me to read. One of encouragement, one of bucking up. So I made it into the office, and by chance, it was a professional women's fellowship luncheon day. They were held in downtown Houston at the Petroleum Club. So across the street, went to that luncheon, sat at my table, and the speaker got up, and she opened with the exact same three verses. I know, it was, it was, I sat at my table, and I was moved to tears. I really, truly felt the supernatural hand of God, and it was encouraging but it was also a bit heavy because I had considered my task done, almost like an Old Testament prophet. I'd warned the king that danger was coming unless he changed course, and I'm done. You know, I'd warned Kinlay about the trouble. It was, he was the captain of the ship. He was supposed to do something about it. Well, sure enough, there was a lot more in my future relating to the Enron saga. I was subpoenaed by the Department of Justice, SEC, and FBI, and both the House and Senate of Congress. The Department of Justice has some scary lawyers. And when they meet with you, they tell you that you are being sworn in to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. And they tell you that even an omission of truth is grounds for a felony perjury charge. Congress feels the same way. So I was in front of Congress, and I think we've got a picture on the screen of it. It was so unnerving, because I'm at the witness stand five hours, and on February 14th, 2002, mind you, Valentine's Day, not the way I normally like to spend <laughs> that day. Um, I'm on the witness stand. The congressmen are sitting up above, and on the floor in between us were all these photographers. So I'm trying to listen to the questions, answer truthfully the whole truth, nothing but the truth. And every time I'd touch my hair or my nose, I'd hear click, 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 click. <laughs> and I thought, okay. What's going on here? Why do I only hear the clicks when I touch my face? Okay, are they trying to get my finger up my nose? Let me sit on my hands. Um, it was a huge distraction, and it seemed like every part of my face tickled. But I got it through, got through that. Two weeks later, I was in front of the Senate, but this time Jeff Skilling was on the witness stand with me. Well, 
The New York Times put a picture on the front page the next day, and my face is not very pleasant as I'm looking at Skilling. One commentator said that I was looking at him like he was something disgusting on my shoe. And when I think about it, I was disgusted with his flawed leadership. He had been the captain of our Titanic and had driven us into that iceberg. And thousands of people lost their jobs at Enron. Billions of dollars were lost. And not only that, Arthur Anderson was indicted for their faulty audit work associated with Enron and had to shut their doors. Thousands of people had their lives ruined, the course of their life forever altered. There were retired Arthur Anderson partners that lost their retirement, and they had nothing to do with this fraud. There was so much pain and suffering that went with this corporate failure. Now, I got through 2001 and 2002 because I did have this tiny faith that God had my back. And with each step in the saga, it seemed like my faith grew. I understand now why they have those Old Testament stories, you know, where Joshua has to step into the raging river before it ceases to flow. That's kind of the way I felt. Something would feel a bit overwhelming, but I would keep moving forward, and the faith to overcome it would, would come with it. It has been a fantastic journey. My life in 2016 is so much better than 2002, and it's not because I was on the cover of Time magazine or because I can make a living giving speeches. It is all about the spiritual world that has been open to me. I feel as if I triggered the promises in the parable of the talents in Matthew 25, where we're, we're given talents, we take a risk for those talents, and Jesus says, come and share the master's happiness. I truly am walking this path in life with great fun, with ease, with little worry. And one of my desires and goals is to help others find this path. When I was asked to speak at this Faith at Work Summit, I actually somehow kept writing it down and referring to it as the Work at Faith Summit. And I think that's not a bad misstatement. Work at faith. I actually think that's the secret to happiness. Find ways to increase your faith, to put your faith to the test. We've heard some great messages this week, and it all seems to be along the same lines. I love that prayer that Jesus has for us right before he's crucified. It's in John 17, and when he first starts to say this prayer for all of us, he is praying that we all might have eternal life. And he says, eternal life is to know God. He defines it. Wow, okay, he wants us to have eternal life, and that is knowing God. Well, clearly that knowing God is meant to be a 24-7 thing. And if it's 24-7, it's clearly it needs to be at work. So how can we follow God, listen to God at work? Well, first off, I'd like to think back on that Martin Luther King Jr. quote. Our lives begin to end the day we remain silent about things that matter. Let's do the opposite. Our lives begin to soar when we speak up about things that matter. Don't stay silent. Be faithful in the little things. Don't cheat on your expense report. Don't misrepresent a transaction. Don't spend something to give a false impression. I think when we're faithful with the little things, the bigger opportunities come. I also love the fact that God get, always uses nature in those parables, those ones we always remember about seed finding fertile soil, or homes built on the solid rock instead of the shifting sand. I find it fascinating that we all have unique fingerprints. There's seven and a half billion people on this planet, and we each have a unique fingerprint. Even identical twins have different fingerprints. So isn't that the God of the universe telling us that we are each so unique? We have unique talents, unique skills, unique drives and personalities, and he is looking to guide us and direct us. My daughter and I like watching movies together, and one of our favorites when she was growing up was Babe, about the little cute pig that thinks he's a sheepdog. Well, the narrator in that movie says that Farmer Hoggett knew that little ideas that tickled and nagged and wouldn't go away should never be ignored, for in them lie the seeds of destiny. 
So I want to encourage you that you have a special race marked out for you. Do it God's way and listen for that Holy Spirit leading, those little ideas that tickle and nag and don't go away, for in them lie the seeds of your destiny. Thank you very much.